Hi, Kirsty, nice to see you. Hello. So my guest today is Kirsty Money. She is a violinist who lives in Nova Scotia, Canada, but today she's not playing the violin for us. Can you tell us what you're gonna play? I'm playing my Swedish nickel harpa, and I'm gonna start by playing a little jig from the suite in G major by Mr. Bach. Thank you, that was so beautiful. Thank you. It's really interesting to hear familiar music that was from one of the cello suites, but on a completely different instrument. Mm -hmm. never... Mostly, do you play traditional nickel harpa music with that instrument, or do you explore different kinds of genres? Um, I explore different kinds of genres, for sure. Um, but I also recognize that this is the traditional, it is actually the traditional folk music instrument of Sweden, This. Swedish nickel harpa. And uh, so I do practice a lot of traditional repertoire on it, as well as explore, you know, early music, Renaissance, medieval, and I also do like, you know, pop songs on it as well. Like you can do a lot of things, nickel harpa. So. And I know you have a wonderful story about how you first heard a nickel harpa, if you could tell us about that. <laughs> yeah, it's a good story. My uh, husband and I were uh, at a friend's wedding in Toronto and we are staying at a lovely bed and breakfast downtown and uh, there was a gentleman staying there too and he played the nickel harpa and one morning he brought out this great big coffin sized box and pulled out this and uh, played it for the guests and I was totally entranced <laughs> just thought why have I never seen or heard this instrument before? <laughs> it's amazing. But of course, at that time, I didn't think, oh, I'm going to go get one. But because uh, I play early music, and I'm also interested in folk music traditions, you know, here in Nova Scotia, we have the big Cape Breton tradition, as well as there's quite a few Irish players around here. So that's well uh, ensconced in the community here. So I've been exposed to that. And in Symphony Nova Scotia, the orchestra in which I play, we do a lot of traditional music shows. Um, so that's kind of in part how I found the Nicka Harpa. The orchestra did a project with two musicians from Scotland, I think in 2009 or 10. And uh, we were in Cape Breton for the Celtic Colors Festival. And the harpist, whose name is Katrina McKay, gave me a disc of her and a fellow named Olaf Johansson. And Olaf is kind of the Mr. Nickel Harpa King, <laughs> one of the big ones. And um, I loved that recording. And I thought, okay, there's that instrument again. Hmm. And then I started searching for recordings with that instrument and the more and more I listened to it I just thought you know what how crazy it would it be for me to get one of these things and see if I could play it <laughs> so his band Vesson came to Celtic Colors in 2013 and 14 I believe and so I went and talked to him and we had a nice chat and here I am <laughs> That's a long wow. story, but there you go. <laughs> That's a great story. I love stories like that where people hear an instrument and they just have to play it. And in fact, my own husband, who's a violinist, um, he heard a violin on the radio when he was five and asked his parents if he could play it. But apparently it took three years <laughs> before they 
<laughs> got him an instrument. Yeah, that's, I've heard that story before where the kids keep sort of knocking on the mummy and daddy door. Hey, I want to play this. That's cool. Maybe if, if some kids hear this today, they'll be saying, hey, how about the nickel harpa? Well, I got, I got some kid-sized nickel harpas. They make them now. So, so for about how, started. about how young would you say in terms of the size? Yeah, I think the child needs to be a little bit bigger. You know how in Suzuki violin they start them really small? Well, as you can see that this is, it's quite a substantial <laughs> instrument. So even the little ones, um, although much smaller, are still quite big for a child. So I would say seven, eight would be a good starting age. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, explain to us what nickel harpa means and how it's similar to a violin and then how it's different. Hmm. Okie dokie. So, nickel harpa means keyed strings. Uh, in Swedish, nickel is the word for key and harpa strings. So, let's see. Similarities to violin. Um, we have, you know, it does look like a violin, doesn't it? A little mm -hmm. bit, especially with those F holes. But that was a an invention that was added um, to the nickel harpa by a man named Erik Sallström, who's kind of the hero of Swedish folk music. And there is a big folk music institute named after him in Sweden. And in the 70s, 80s, I think he did a lot of um, revamping this old instrument. Um, so the F holes, he moved these sympathetic strings, which can you see mm -hmm. those? Yeah. So I have four main playing strings, three with keys, and then you can see that this one here, there's no keys on it. That's the drone string, okay? Because so, the nickel harpa is a droning instrument. Um, and there are all the rows. They're like teeth almost, eh? Look at that. It's pretty wild. Um, <clears throat> and then the sympathetic strings, I have 12 of those and I don't play those okay that's why the instrument looks complicated because everybody wonders if I'm playing all of those strings I'm not I'm just playing four and then the sympathetic strings are tuned to the semitones of the octave so that you get a nice ring so there's the notes and there's a sympathetic string that you have to tune quite exactly Yeah, it's interesting. It has a built-in natural resonance that's quite unique. It sounds like you're in a cathedral, even though you're in your living room. That's right. Yeah. And that's the unique feature of the nickel harpa. And I mean, in terms of similarity, you know, violin, the left hand is finding the notes, and then you've got your bow, your breath. This is the expressive part. So I would say that's kind of where the similarities end. <laughs> Well, a lot of people have asked me, you know, well, is it similar to violin? It must be much easier because you don't have to play in tune. You just play a key. And that's very true, you know, but you also have to play the right key. And uh, that was something that, <laughs> and it still is something um, that you work on constantly, particularly me, because I'm new to this instrument still relatively, um, finding the right notes. And I should also tell you that when you go down to a lower string on a nickel harpa, your arm moves this way, whereas mm -hmm. on a violin, it moves this way. Mm -hmm. So it's the complete opposite. So I, I, that's a big that's a big change. And some violinists who have tried it, friends of mine, they're like, "Oh man." I don't know if I could do that because <laughs> you have you really have to retrain the brain. I had a question about shifting. So do you think sort of in positions in terms of getting up the keys? Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, as my first teacher, Olaf said, you always have to have a plan. <laughs> <laughs> that was one. Of, I, I always remember that you have to move your hand and you have to have a plan. <laughs> Because it is a little bit like mountain climbing, you know, if you don't have a plan of where you're going to shift, 
I mean, some people are really good at improvising that. And I think probably if you've been playing nickel harpa for, you know, all your life, it's like how you feel moving around the violin. So, you know, people have asked me if I'm going to forget playing violin, because obviously I've been playing this a lot more. And there's just no way it's not possible because all of those patterns from violin playing from when I was small have been deeply ingrained. <laughs> so I'm not going to forget, like I don't forget. Um, so this is, I'm still, you know, rewiring things in my brain in order to play this. So before I have a couple more questions for you, I'd love to hear one of your tunes. I know you write a lot of original tunes for this instrument. Yeah. I can't say I've just started like in the last couple of years, I've just started experimenting with writing tunes. I just thought, oh, well, yeah, other people write tunes. I guess I should give it a go and see what happens. <laughs> um, and it's actually kind of fun because, you know, you're creating something that's yours and, you know, you might work on something that a particular sound that you like. So, for example, this tune. Um, it's called the Grind Polska, and I've written it during this pandemic, and it's just an expression of how I feel where we're at right now, you know? So, here we go. I'll play some of this for you. Okay, the Grind Polska. I just love that. It's very, very beautiful. Thank you. You know, the use of those drone strings, it really has a medieval flavor for me. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So what kind of background did you have, like, growing up with early music, if any? Yeah. So my parents, um, we always had music in the house. Both of them grew up with music. Um, my dad, in particular, was a real music nerd. Um, he listened to all kinds of things, actually. Uh, early music, medieval music, of course, classical music, um, a lot of choral music. My dad sang in numerous choirs. When he went to university, he was singing in the Clare College choir there. So he loved singing. And my dad just, he loved music. And um, so we were really lucky kids, actually. We, uh, my mom, for the first 10 years, she didn't work. She was constantly working with me and my brother. My brother is a cellist. Um, and, you know, having music in the house was an extraordinary thing. And my dad had these crazy early music recordings <laughs> um, that had, you know, crumb horns and uh, crazy drums and yells and hurdy gurdies. And I do have a visceral memory where I just was dancing around. I must have been, I don't know, five or six. And he would put this album on. We still have it actually at home. And uh, I would just dance around and it was dance music, very much so. 
um, very rhythmic and very like a lot of groove to it. You know, that last tune has a lot of groove to it. And there's something very satisfying about playing music with a great groove. I know that, um, you know, when we play in symphonic orchestras, the whole, the art form is different in that, you know, there's a big themes and long phrases. Um, it's not so much like that in um, folk music. Uh, you're always playing for dancers with this instrument. And so in order to play for dancers, they need to have a good groove um, to be able to dance well. So, yeah. So when you're writing a tune, are you just like noodling with harmonies or are there melodic fragments that come to you? Is there... Yeah, that's a good question because I've been asked that quite a bit. Like, how are you writing tunes all of a sudden? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Um, often there will be a melodic fragment that suddenly just sort of appears. Um, and I might noodle around with it for a little bit. Uh, and then something, you know, these tunes aren't, you know, great big long orchestral scores. They're only either eight bars each section, or sometimes if it's a longer tune, it might be 16 bars. Um, so they're not big um, that way. Um, and yeah, sometimes there will be a harmony that I, uh, you know, a drone sound that I really like. So I might work around that first. Um, this is, that's what happened with this tune, actually. I just started mucking around with the drone. I really love drones. Maybe it's my Scottish heritage. I don't know. <laughs> um, I love pipes, uh, and that sound. Um, so working with drones, this is a droning instrument for sure. It's the sister of the hurdy-gurdy. Um, is, you know, that, that's the kind of sound I really, I really get into, so... And um, I want you to tell us about your very first lesson and what that was like and what you worked on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Olaf, if you're watching this, have a good laugh. Okay, so picture this. So I'm in a professional violinist level, going to go study with the master of Nicol Harpa performing and teaching and playing. Like he's, you know, he's the dude um, I somehow managed to get a couple of days of lessons with him uh, in 2015. So I went to his house and we worked all day, pretty much. Um, and he basically introduced me to this instrument and how to approach it, what you need to start working on as a beginner, especially the bow technique, which has been a real eye-opener for me because it's very different. Um, but it was also... <laughs> A very humbling experience because I knew nothing right I just knew nothing and it's I'm not used to that you know being a highly professionally trained orchestral musician that's what I've been doing all my life to go into a master's house with nothing <laughs> so, um, but at the same time it was just one of the best experiences of my life actually in turn my creative life just because it was like somebody just pulled back this giant big velvet curtain and said, hey, look at all of this. It's all new to you and uh, have fun. <laughs> so that's what's been going on since then. But um, when we had talked before, you had told me that there was something you had to work on at first and he, he went off and did some chores. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is a good point. So, you know, Lots of people say, well, the, like I said earlier, the nickel harpa must be easier because you got these keys and you don't hit a wrong note. Um, well, as long as you're in the right place with your hand, yeah, generally we hope that we don't hit wrong notes, but nickel harpa players hit wrong notes. It's like hitting wrong notes on the piano, actually, because this works much more like a piano keyboard. Um, and you have to tune the instrument really well in order for it to ring properly. If you want that great big depth of resonance, the instrument really needs to be highly tuned. It's like, you know, when you go to an early music concert and there's this person with a little hammer tuning that harpsichord for 45 minutes or whatever, um, it's the same idea with the nickel harpa. Now, I don't spend 45 minutes each time 
uh, I come to the harpa. You know, I might do a quick tuning, um, but then if I have a, a performance, I'll spend you know more detailed time tuning, more exact tuning. And I have a tuner uh, tuning the harpa. And you know, you see these teeth here. Mm -hmm. These they, they call them tangents, but you can also adjust those as well. Um, so you adjust them to your tuner to get a really great sound. So yeah, I spent the first hour of my first lesson tuning and Olaf went to go and, you know, deal with the household chores or other business that he had to take care of. He said, yeah. have fun. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks so much for this. Um, I'm going to uh, just ask if there's one more tune you wanted to play for us before we end the conversation. Sure. Uh, let's see. Well, I could play a Biscala tune. Um, he is a very famous uh, nickel harpa player in the 18th and 19th centuries, um, real virtuoso. And we have 57 tunes of his um, that we all study and play. So this is number six. There we go. <laughs> much. So in the description of this video, we'll put all kinds of Nickel Harpa resources and your YouTube channel and your website. And um, hopefully some people will, will take it up. Yeah. That'd Thanks be great. so much. I'm here. I'm ready to help beginners. That'd be great. Thanks for this, Leah.